You are going to have to say no a lot in order to get to a better yes. The way that you can actually grow spiritually, the way as a man that you can move forward, get really good at saying the word no. Welcome to the Step Up Podcast, where our goal is to help you step up as a man in every area of your life. I'm your host, Dave Kinney, and I'm joined by my pastor, Pastor Chris Kuba. PC, what are you watching on Netflix? I'm watching. I'm watching a show with Caitlin because this is this is what you do. What is you have it? A eight to almost eighteen year old daughter. Is you figure out? Hey, let's watch a show together. Is it like Princess Diaries or something? No, it is The Resident. Okay, what's it about? She's actually picked some pretty good like binge shows, and so I basically just picked it because she picked it. I I actually could care less about it. I actually, it's pretty good actually, but I mainly did it because. You know, like the list of like things that like me and the almost 18 year old girl oh, yeah. are just like sinking in on, you know, it's just kind of growing a little bit different. So I'm like, if you're in it and you'll let me watch it with you, I'm in. My, so Emily never, what we never watch shows it's, together. It's, it's disappointing actually. And I convinced her one night, I was like, hey, we're going to watch this show. It's intense. It's murdery. It's right up murdery. your alley. You're going to love it. And it's the OJ Simpson documentary. And I Which was one. It's the the ESPN one. Oh, the five part one. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so good. And so she finally agrees. Like we're gonna watch this together. It is up. She loves that kind of like you know what's going on, yeah. murder stuff like that. Um, and so I was really excited because she was gonna watch it with me. And we start the first episode, and she is asleep within <laughs> 47, 48 seconds. Y'all have told and us that story multiple times on yeah. shows. You've encouraged you to watch. <laughs> but I've watched it. I've stuck it out. And dude, it's. It's crazy. It's, it's basically just, like it's, a story of L.A. Yeah, a lot I mean, of it's L.A. More of like the background yep. and the set, you know, all the scene and the setting, and it's so good. Like, it, I'm I'm a sucker for any O.J. anything. Like, I just yep. love it, love all of it. So, uh, there's another one, Cuba Gooding Jr. He like I don't even know the name of it. I've, but, I've heard about that one, but I have not watched that. Yeah, one. Yeah, it's a really good one to watch. Um, but it uh, feels like Netflix is also <clears> stepping its game up. Yeah. Lately. And not, you know, every, everyone has a platform, everyone has a streaming service now. And so it was like a couple of years that ne Netflix took a back seat. Right. And now they're back in the game. Did you see they're going to have NFL football? Yeah. Christmas and they're doing Day all these games. Live they're going to show and, Netflix. So. Yeah. They're doing all that live stuff. And so Netflix is out here. Yeah. It was a bad day whenever they did the whole password you know, you can't share your password. Yeah, stuff. it was a detrimental day it was, for mine. It was a, a lot of people. I'm sure they got a lot more revenue. But for all of our listeners out there, there is a way <laughs> you can still get around it. So, do you I'm know sure the story of Netflix? That's a great book, by the way. What book? Uh, it is called The Story of Netflix. I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay, actually. I have not. Uh, I know a little bit. I mean, I remember yeah. when it was like a DVD service that you ordered yeah. and they oh, sent yeah. in the mail and all that kind of stuff. But no, not early really. 2000s. I got him Reed Hastings, co-founder of Netflix. Okay. He approached Blockbuster. This is what's so cool. He approached Blockbuster with the opportunity to sell his, it was the DVD service. And Blockbuster said, no, no one's going to do that. And instead they stuck oh to their word. guns, told him no, rejected him. And now, of course, we know there's only one Blockbuster left and it is in some random town in like Oregon or something. Oregon yeah. Or something like it's that. like a museum now. Yeah. But, yeah. Man, I have like great memories of going to Blockbuster yeah. whenever I was a kid. It's hilarious to think back. Sure. And that was just a different. What a missed opportunity. How different it was. And just to think through the impact of that. No, led him to, the Hastings to go. The, story, the book talks a little about this, how it led him to kind of begin to just sort of craft and make. And then, of course, they end up getting their own original stuff and. And of course, now Netflix, I mean, my kids watch YouTube and Netflix. They don't watch cable. Yeah. That's all they do. And so it's just kind of a, it's super interesting to see just the power of a no um, and, and how from a business standpoint, we know so many different situations we've heard, of, of course, over the years of like, you get rejected in this one particular place or somebody gets rejected for a job and it ends up being kind of this breakthrough mm -hmm. type thing. Um, I've been thinking about something though, a lot. Um from a spiritual standpoint, how the opposite of that is true. How the way that you can actually grow spiritually, the way as a man that you can move forward, um, isn't necessarily, yes, it's definitely going to have opportunities that come up and you, you know, you look back and you see how God used that no to change things, but more so how a man has to get really good at saying the word no. 
Hmm. What do you think about that? Because uh, uh, you're, you are going to have to say no a lot in order to get to a better yes. So you're going to have to make sure that you uh, respond to certain things along the way that come up saying, hey, I know this thing may be a good thing, but I've got something better that I want to go pursue. And so therefore, I think the scripture teaches this too, men have to say no a lot if they're going to look up and be successful in their business and their families and their lives and their marriages as they move forward. Okay. Dive, dive deeper on that. They're going to have to say no. What are they going to have to say no to? Okay. Um, well, a big one is temptation. I mean, yeah. let's just think about it. Okay. First Corinthians 10, 13, listen to this, this passage. No temptation has overtaken you. That is not common to man. Mm -hmm. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, this is key. He will always provide the way of escape. Uh, that you may be able to endure it. Meaning this, he is always going to give you the chance to make the right call, but you are going to have to get really good at saying the word no. Yeah. The, yeah. There's always going to be the opportunity for you to say no to the temptation that the enemy of God is bringing to your life. And we know temptations are such that it's not as though a lot of times they're labeled temptation. Mm -hmm. They're instead look super appealing. They look super enticing. They look like it's something like, I, I, I really want this. It's something desirable. But he's saying here, there's always going to be a way out. But at the end of the day, he's not saying that the way is going to be provided for you and then he's going to force you to make the choice. He's right. saying the way is going to be provided for you to get out of the situation. But you've got to be willing to say these very powerful words no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, like I'm, I'm not going to. I'm not going to engage in that. I'm not going to go pursue that. I'm not going to do whatever. And I just think the more no's that you say, the better you're going to be able to say yes to the right things whenever you need to the most. And I just think godliness comes with you having to say no to your flesh, no to your desires, no to those things that the enemy, who's pretty, pretty good. I mean, he's he's not. Well, that's what I was going to say is. <laughs> In order to say no, we've used the word enemy several times yeah. now. You have to know your enemy. For sure. And so I guess for listeners and 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 everyone who's uh, watching, what do we know about the enemy and how the enemy tempts us? Yeah, let's think about this. So um, one, the enemy, while he's good and crafty, isn't really that innovative. He does the same thing with us that he did all the way back in the garden. And what did he do with Adam and Eve? Uh, he went and he, ch he challenged those around the man and basically allowed passivity to be what ends up taking him out. Mm -hmm. And he did it by saying, did God really say this? Did God really say this? So kind of questioning what you yep. know to be true. And think about how often in your own temptations, how you start off being like, okay, I know this isn't right, but man, I don't know. This looks pretty good. Or I, I kind of want this. The enemy, at worst, first of all, let's just talk about this. Uh, so... You and I are different ages, right? And uh, are different stages of life with our kids, that kind of stuff. The temptations that you face right now are going to be different than the temptations that I face because mm -hmm. one of the things you got to know about this for our enemy, he's very personal, right? Right. So what he's going to go after with you may be different than me. What is going to be going after with me may be different than the listener that's listening to this on the other side of the camera. But you got to know this, whatever your thing is, the enemy is going to figure out something that's desirable, that's going to take you out, that's not going to be super obvious that that is the case that's specific to you. Yeah. Yeah. There's a strategy behind the enemy's totally. temptation. Totally. It's personal. Knows your opponents, yeah. right? You know, he's like a football coach that analyzes the other team so he knows their tendencies so he can begin to go uh, counteract those tendencies. The enemy does the same thing with you. He's not just going to do a one size fits all and like, okay, so whether it be lust or whether it be money or whether it be, you know, fame or whatever else that, that may be totally different. Right. I mean, yeah. you know, you and I've had some conversations along the way too. And we may get this in another episode that, you know, some of those same temptations that used to take me down whenever I was your age, aren't the same for you. But then again, some of the things that maybe I'm working through sure. now are some of the things you're, I mean, it's just, yeah. it's very personal. Right. Um, I don't think I'd tell you the enemy is. He's yeah. Also, hold on on that. Yeah. Let's go. Temptation. It's not one size fits all. No. For sure not. I mean, it's really not. And I think that we're, um, 
we need to be super aware that the enemy of God is trying to do what you said, Mm -hmm. get you to settle for a lesser version than what God has for you. How many times do you see in scripture, um, the enemy, Satan using scripture to tempt someone towards something else? He did it to Jesus himself, which is, he quoted scripture to him. Right. Yeah. But I also think he's just trying to get you to take a cheap. Yes. Yeah. That's ultimately what he wants to do. Let's talk about the enemy. The enemy is very uh, personal. The enemy, second of all, is also very patient. Um, how many guys do we know who did it well for a long time and then kind of kind of failed at the end? We didn't. We haven't talked about this yet, uh, but we texted we uh, about it? yesterday or no. two days ago about about someone that you and I both looking up oh, to and and it's the worst, un- unbelievable. Uh, man and and leader and all those things, but there's a there was a slip into temptation and that happened just along kinda, the way. I mean, it just one it causes I think in, in a good way healthy fear, but also a, just a reminder like you're going to be saying no, men, like till the very last dying breath. Yeah, like the enemy's not just going to like you like, know he's had a good run. We're good. And I'm going to leave him alone. Like he, he'll take you out, Influ- whether it be influence nationally, like the situation that we're referring to, or whether it is influence even just with your own immediate family. Mm-hmm. I've just seen too many, you know, guys along the way who have raised families, have raised kids, have got grandkids, have got all of that, and then make a decision to kind of do something just stupid with their spouse. And you're just right. sort of like, I mean, you're just, you just got to get used to it for the rest of your life. You're going to have to say no. You're just going to have to say no. And, and by doing that, you just got to know you can wait the enemy out, but you've got to make sure you know the, the tactics you're going to have to use. And a lot of that means you're just going to have to say that magic word a lot, which is, no, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to compromise now. I, I know that I've, I know that it wouldn't be as big of a deal in your mind, maybe at that time, because you've, you've been faithful for a while, but I'm still going to say no, you know, and, um, well, keep going on the, the enemy is patient. Yeah. Because I think, yes, in, in larger terms, like your the scope of your life, yeah. I think the enemy is patient. Absolutely. Like you mentioned, we're in two different seasons of life, two different yeah. seasons of marriage and parenting and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, he's patient throughout your life, but I would sure. say he's also patient in the day to day. There's no question. I mean, the enemy, the enemy knows when you're weak. Yep. yep. I mean, it's a biblical thing. So for the man who's out there who you find yourself falling into temptation whenever you're tired and it's late at night or uh, when you're on a trip or something yeah. like that and you're out of your regular rhythm and yep. routine, that is also evidence that the enemy of God is patient. Yeah, he'll just when wait he you strikes. out. Yeah. Well, it's think exactly about it. Right. He didn't go and attempt Jesus during the 40 days of fasting. He started to tempt him right after it was over. Mm hmm. So it wasn't like he just thought, oh, this would be a good idea. Today would be a good day. No, he he waited it out to where he knew he was at his weakest. He was starving. He was tired. He was all of those things. And that's when he kind of began to pounce. And Mm -hmm. I think, yes, you're right. It's not just in the scope of your life. You're right. But it is also just in the meaning, if you're going to have a, if you're going to go on a marriage retreat and you're going to invest and you're going to pour into some of these things we've actually been talking through in this podcast and your relationships and your marriage and some of your leadership, He'll, he'll be happy to wait for a couple of weeks after the shine of that's over. Mm-hmm. And he'll kind of go then and and go. That's another thing too. He's, he's personally, he's patient. Third thing I would tell you about the enemy, kind of knowing who he is, he is also very persistent. He's yeah. just not going to give up, right? It's just not going to like just kind of, oh, I'll try this a couple of times and then be done. No, it's just like a, a which again goes back to why I just believe you got to say no a lot. Right. And, and you can't assume a no two weeks ago is the same no today. That's that's really good because you're exactly right. First of all, it's really important to understand your enemy. It's also really important to know yourself. Sure. That uh, you are a sinner. Yeah, yeah. It's what you do. Yeah. And so you never necessarily fully overcome sin. Mm-hmm. And the enemy knows that. The enemy realizes that his persistence can lead to your demise. Yeah. And therefore, what's he going to do? He's going to persistently tempt you over yep. long periods of time. Which is why it's not only just a matter of you saying no, you got to have other guys around you that are going to be like, dude, you know you said, you said no to this, that remind you of that. That don't assume you're good, you graduated, you know the information. Right. Because information, knowledge, and what to do isn't necessarily a translation immediately into saying the right things, doing the right things in the moment. Instead, it's just got to be a continual. I just got to know, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. And I just think that's that sets you apart. That's something you got to, 
you got to do. For sure. So it's, it's the temptation of the enemy is personal. It's persistent. Uh, and he's patient yep. with how he does it. Um, I've heard it said like this and you and I were actually just talking a little while ago about it. Um, the enemy of God is all of mankind and one when it comes to yeah. people falling into temptation, yeah. every human being who's ever lived, who's ever existed has fallen into the temptation of the enemy, mm -hmm. except one man. And that is Jesus. And so I think one, we just need to realize that we need to have an yeah. understanding that, um, the enemy is good at what he does. Sure. And, um, that ultimately I think helps us in our, in our fight for holiness or fight for righteousness. But, uh, knowing your enemy is really, really important. Uh, it's also really important to know yourself. What would you say are, are some of the primary things that uh, we need to be aware of and in, in how the enemy is going to tempt us and yep. what we have a tendency to slip into? Uh, I think greed is a big one. And I, that word is typically associated with money. And I don't think there's any question about it, particularly when we're talking to a bunch of men, that's a part of it. But I'm not positive that it's only that, right? Mm -hmm. So just greed, when I say greed, I mean, I think just the desire to want or to need more. Um, I, I can, I, I'm not in a, 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 a I mean, I'm, I'm well taken care of. I, I, God's provided all of our needs. I don't want to say that, but like, I'm not in a profession where I like, if I can just like, you know, I can work harder. I can, I can, I can make more, right. It's not like there's like, so, so it's easy to act like, but I can still very much struggle with the idea of greed because of this. Yeah. But I always am never satisfied. I always just want more people. Mm -hmm. I always want more of this. I always want to be more successful. I always want to be more whatever. I think that that kind of just a constant desire for saying what I have is not enough. I have to have more can lead men to do, I think some things where they compromise along the way, right? They cut corners in order to make sure to make more profits. They push the envelope a little bit, maybe in terms of their leadership style or their aggression, because basically it's a reflection on them that things are not producing at the rate that they need to. Yeah. Or I do think the idea of just, man, I got to have more money. I got to have more stuff. I got to have more provision. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm realizing I'm in the stage. I got four teenagers, all active. I got uh, now three drivers and I've got, uh, you know, one about to go to college. I need a, there's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot. You're in an inexpensive so, season of life. Yeah. And so there's this assumption that like, man, I just got to, you know, but we also want to take vacations and we want to be able to go together as a yep. family. And that's, a, there, there's this pressure to where even if you have, you feel like there's this, like, I've got to have more. And I think that insatiable desire is something that we kind of have to push up against and be like, no, I'm not going to be defined by that. Because most men, what do we do when we get together? Hey, what do you do for a living? And we're sizing each other up from the second we have a conversation. I was going to ask, do you think that some of the the greed stuff, which obviously kind of tends itself toward money and finances yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Do you think it really stems from also a place of comparison? Oh, for sure. There's no question about it. And men, I mean, men naturally are always, I mean, we've been taught that from early on, right? I mean, you got class rank where you yep. are. You've got basically, you know, what team you're on. Did you make the team? And, and, and which team are you on? Do you start? I mean, there's just kind of this all sizing thing up. And so you're always trying to figure out, okay, where's my spot? And then where do I got to fight and claw work to get, to get more, to get further up? I think the same thing is true a lot of times when it comes to men, because so much of our identity is defined by what it is that we do, how much money that we make, what our lifestyle and all those things begin to begin to look like. And so because of that, there's just this, it, be, it begins to overtake you. And, and, and yes, obviously cheating, stealing, all of those types of things are a part of it that you got to say no to. And I think we would all be like, of course. I think there's a lot more subtle stuff though, where a lot of men basically will sell their souls at the office to try to be able to make more money Mm -hmm. And I, I think you just, it's the spiritual man. No, I'm not going to do that. So I'm how not do you, how do get you in fight it? Race. Like, I mean, I, cause I agree with you. I think everything you're saying is right. That every, every human specifically, every man struggles yeah. with greed um, or having a greedy heart or a greedy spirit, or even just a, a greedy time in their life. Mm -hmm. How do you fight against it? This is going to sound simplistic and I don't mean it to be that way. So, so, but I do think it is this simple. You give, yeah. you, you got to be a giver. You've got to be somebody who's generous. So what that means is, is that if you want to, if you want to guard against having money take over your life, the Bible says the antidote to that is by giving that money away. You got to be a, be a generous person. 
Uh, if you want to guard against the idea and the greed of basically making the entire company or the entire job or the entire identity about you, then give away your influence and give away your knowledge. Hmm. Like, like I, I want to be a guy who at the end of my ministry have raised up multiple other people who can do it better than me, not necessarily do it just like me. Right. And I think the way that I'm going to get over me being a big deal is by having other people have other opportunities that I get to celebrate. That's a hard thing to do at the core of who I am, but I got to say no to it being all about me. And so I think for the same thing, giving away your influence, giving away your, your leadership, this is a key, giving away opportunities. Mm. There's certain things that may come up along the way where it's like, man, that would be a really cool thing and be like, hey, you should go do this. And yes, it may means that they get the, 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 the check. It means they get the notoriety from that or whatever. I just think God's gonna honor that. But I also think that the no to just basically me, all or nothing, money, influence, all that type of thing is gonna lead to a very tragic fall. Yeah. Because what does the Bible say? The Bible says that you know God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So you, giving is a way to fight against that temptation of you got to do more, you got to be more, you got to make more, you got to have more. All right. So let me, let me represent some of our listeners right now. Here we go. Here comes the preacher talking yeah, about giving sure. yeah. and all that kind of stuff. We take a lot of shots for that in the church at yeah, large. Yeah. Um, and one, obviously we're doing this for the benefit of people because God's word sure. is very, very true. And when you live it out, it blesses your life. Um, let me frame the same question in a different way. If you could teach your kids to do one thing with money, what would it be? Give. I, mean, I, don't mean that. I don't mean that flippantly, but I mean, I think I've had that conversation with him even now. What does it look like to start? Because I think if you give little, when you, you have little, I think you'll be able to give more when you have and more, and the biblical principle has to be true. The parable of the talent says, if you're faithful with little, then I'll give you more. Like yeah. that's the, re and, and the reward is that you get more money, and the reward is that it says you enter into the joy of your master. So like I would just, I, I know at the end of the day, God's not opposed to you having money, but he's very opposed to money having you, and it will if you that's begin good. to think, I've got a, I've got to hold on. I've got, cause, cause whenever you get it, it's never enough. Yep. It always has this temptation to where like, oh, but I could have these set of golf clubs or I could have this car. We were, so we were talking this. literally yesterday <laughs> so. about uh, what we were making when we first started. Oh yeah. And we were laughing because back then it was really small amounts yeah, of money sure. because we are not in a profession where you can just have a good year and yeah. increase your income. But, um, we were talking about how when, when we were young and when we had loaded. just Emily and I, and we were making <laughs> really not a lot of money, loaded. we felt like we were loaded. loaded. How am I and we, all this we were so year? far under the poverty line. It wasn't funny, so but it just, it felt like a yeah. lot. And so I think you're always on that hamster wheel. Yeah. If you allow yourself to be on it, that you may think, well, if I, if I made 10% more then that would really solve a lot of my problems, I promise you it's a guarantee if you make 10% more, your, your expenses will go up 10% sure. or Easily. 11% or yeah. 15% and you'll want more and more and more and more. Oh. There's a contentment issue uh, wrapped up in that too. We're in a season right now with the kids where Emily and I were talking this past weekend about potentially starting an allowance system. Oh yeah. Okay. My allowance system is let's give them a dollar and work them like dogs in the backyard to make sure that they earn it. Uh, Emily's slightly more generous with them than I am. The reason we're doing that is not because we think that giving them an allowance is going to help them uh, tie to the church and move the needle in a big way yeah. whenever it comes to our church's budget or anything like that. It's way more about their hearts. Yeah. The Bible is very, very clear. Where your treasure is, yep. that's where your heart's going to be. Yeah. Your heart follows after where your money goes. And so this is not a, a, a church fundraising campaign. This is about the heart that exists yeah. within you. Uh, being made healthy and whole under the submission of scripture. But it goes back to, because this isn't about giving so much. That's just a, that's a strategy. But you got to say no to that temptation early on, which is going to say, hey, you don't have enough. Right. Or you need more, or you need to make sure that you have more than last time, or you need to make sure that you have more influence, or that you need to make sure that they give you a little more recognition. That greed just begins to... Yep. 
to, to kind of overtake and you're going to have to just constantly say no to that. Let me give you another area though that you're going to have to also say no to a lot, men, is sexual temptation. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, let's just, how many men do we know who've been taken out over this specific issue and not protecting themselves, but instead compromising. And so I, let's just talk through what that looks like. Cause it's, it's like, okay, well, I just need to say no to uh, an affair. I need to say no, 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 no. I think you get, this is where I think it's so key, man. You've got to get good at saying no to the opportunities where those things could happen. Mm -hmm. So therefore what that means, like go old school, go Billy Graham rules, like go to the point yeah. where basically like, I, I'm not going to be in a one-on-one -on -one meeting by myself with somebody from the opposite sex. I'm not going to ride in a car. I mean, I get it. Some of your work situations have exceptions, but I can assure you of this. You most likely aren't the exception. That is the temptation that is coming to you, telling you that you, this is okay. You need to be able to do this. And I just think we just need to be men who just say no a lot, 15 steps yeah. before you're in a bedroom with somebody else who you're not supposed to be. And, and I just, so therefore, hey, I'm not going to hang out tonight. I'm not going to go out after work. I'm not going to uh, respond to that text. Yes. Just, it is better for you to be awkward, weird, and married than it is for you to be friendly and lose your marriage. That's exactly right. So I just think it goes back to, you're gonna have to say no to little small things so that it doesn't lead you down the path. Proverbs chapter five talks a lot about this and it talks about basically the, 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 the adulterous woman and basically how you are not to go and fall prey to the adulterous woman. And the, the, the description that it uses is, don't go down the street Mm -hmm. If you do, you're going to look in the window and see if she's home. And then you're going to go look inside and knock on the door and see if she's able to talk. And eventually, like, it, the point is, you, you, you fight that battle, not when you're at the house already there seeing that, hey, I would like to invite you in and why don't you come in and let's yeah. have this relationship. You fight the battle by saying no to going down the street multiple steps before mm -hmm. that. So, man, when it comes to sexual temptation, clearly you don't need to have sex with somebody that's not your wife. That's obvious. The no, the power of no is by saying that long before yep. the opportunity ever presents itself. There's such, a, there's such a temptation and tendency to see how close to the gray area sure. you can get. When what the Bible says is you should see that the gray area is over there, turn the other direction and sprint. It's the one area, sexual temptation, where we are not told to fight against the enemy. Mm -hmm. Instead, it actually says that we are to flee. We are to run the opposite direction. Don't wow. fight it, good. run, run away. Ephesians 5 verse three says, there should not even be a hint of sexual immorality among you. How does there not gonna be a hint? By me living a life where I say no so often that I am able uh, to, to not even have accusations be levied against me because it's like, oh no, he, would, he, would, he wouldn't even have been there. Right. He wouldn't even have been in that situation. Like, yep. so uh, uh, everybody thinks they're the exception. And, and I'm just telling you too many people started out as the exception and then ended up as the exact same role of everybody else. Uh, 15 years ago, before you and I ever worked together, um, before we lived in the same state or city and before we were even that close, mm -hmm. uh, I heard you give a talk that forever changed one of the practices in my life. Uh, you keep a, it's either on your notes app. Mine is now on my notes app because of this talk so long ago, uh, or you keep it written somewhere. Um, all of the things that you would lose. Yeah. That's probably an episode. If itself. you fell, yeah. it, it does need to be, we need to make that an yeah. episode. On it was a, an on exercise, basically write out all the different things that you would lose if you uh, failed morally. And so consequences of a moral failure is what it's called. I'm up to 33 things. Hmm. And it's basically a very detailed list of what would happen if I was to compromise. Yeah. And it's literally meant to scare the actual hell out of me. Yeah. Like actual, I don't want anywhere near yeah. me, all of that kind of thing. But the practice alone is just kind of a reminder of this is why you say no. This is why I got to say no to this. Like, like, again, most things feel harmless, but things that feel harmless are what the enemy does because he's not going to parade again with a big banner that says temptation, temptation, temptation. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's going to come as an agent of light yep. looking at something desirable. And I got to be like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. Yep. I'm not going to do that. 
I'm not going to do that. I'm not, nah, I'm not going to do that. Those words are powerful. So all the men listening, here's something I want you to do genuinely, because it, it really did change, change a practice of mine 15 years ago. I want you to start a notes, a note on your phone or find your journal or something like that. And I want you to start writing down when you think of it, something that you would lose if you forfeited your marriage or your personal purity. Yeah. Um, and to be very transparent with everybody, the most recent thing that I added to mine uh, is I would I would potentially lose the right to walk my daughter down the aisle yeah, on her oh wedding yeah. day it's because of a, a frayed relationship and yeah. and it's just it's just not worth it. So, or whatever, yeah. Um, that's good. So yeah. uh, I I do think these two things are huge. Yeah. I mean, fighting against the temptation of greed and the temptation of sexual immorality. What else would you say is one of the key things that we need to be ready and willing to say no to? I think you have to say no to something that is good in order to say yes to something that is best. Hmm. Okay. Let me explain that a little bit. Um, I think this is true like organizationally. So for instance, we, part of our exercise that we do is we make a tier one, tier two, tier three list, yep. both for personnel as well as for capital and just kind of priorities. The idea being tier one is sort of like 18 to 24 months, uh, 18 to 36 months. What are the things we have to do, have to hire, have to buy, have to do whatever in the next, that time frame in order for us just to do effective ministry. Tier two is basically that three to five years. So like what's a little bit further down the road and what are some things we kind of need to kind of be on the, on the thinking through. And then the tier three is sort of a five plus years if we had all of a sudden a big windfall of a massive amount of money, what would we spend it on? What would we do? That kind of thing. Let's just stream mm. a little bit. The reason that we do that is because we know that there's things that come up, new programs, new initiatives, new staff people that we meet or whatever. And we're like, oh man, we got to do this. Yep. Like we got to do this. And the, the, the temptation is, is that I got to jump on this. Now, I'm not saying that it's not good organizationally for you at times to have to say yes to opportunities you didn't see coming, clearly. But I don't think that's, typically the pattern. Right. I think instead it's, are you going to be willing to be disciplined to the plan that you plan? And whenever this new exciting thing wasn't pressing and think about how many times this happened, things it's have helped, helped us, us tremendously. So just stay on the right course. And we've looked back because we've now done this, I think three times Yeah, we've looked back and everything on the, the tier one list and a few things on the tier two list were all accomplished right. because we stayed the course. Yeah. So I think, the things that we got brought up were good yeses, but we knew we needed to say no because we had a best plan that we needed to go execute. We, we're, we're about to start some construction projects and here at the church. Before we did that, what did we do? We got a master plan. We spent money on a master plan for all of our facilities. Why? Because we knew we're an idea minute. That's who we are. That's what we love doing. And oh, we should do this. And oh, we should do this. And oh, we should do this. That's great. But really, I think... We need to be able to say, no, we can't do that. That's a good thing for the future because here's our master plan. This is what we want to be able to do. And so saying no at times organizationally to, to good things can help you say yes to, to, to better things. Let's think about that from a personal level, okay? Man, I think at times you're going to have amazing opportunities that get presented to you, maybe a job opportunity, maybe a trip, maybe a guy's trip, maybe a something like that. I'm not saying you need to say no to all of those things all the time. I'm not. But what I am saying is this. Many times you got to say no to some really cool opportunities because you need to be home with your family. That's right. Or you need to say no to that specific job because the ramifications and what it's going to do for your family and kids and your connection to the church and whatever else are going to be affected. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm not saying you need to say no all the time to every time you get asked to play golf or whatever the case may be, but you're probably going to have to say no more than you want. Right. And that's going to help you be better employee. It's going to be, help you be a better father. It's going to help you be a better husband. I think it's going to make your yeses be even sweeter because you're going to be fewer. But I think on a per per personal and uh, personal level, um, every great new opportunity may not be the best one. And sometimes you may need to say no to some crazy good jobs because God's not done with you where you're at. Well, and going back to even some some of what we've talked about in previous episodes, saying no now helps you keep the priorities that you have identified in your life on track. Sure. It really does go back to the tier one, tier two, yeah. tier three things. 
do that with your life for sure. Do that with your marriage and your family and, and your goals and all that kind of stuff. And, and realize those are the priority Yeah, and, and allowing yourself to say no to some things that are really good can ultimately set you up to do things that are best for you. Crazy. Good best for your life. I served at a place for 17 years and many times throughout that, that tenure that I was there, I got opportunities that felt like the greatest opportunities ever. Mm hmm. And, uh, in the midst of praying through them, it felt like I was missing out by saying no to those opportunities. As I now look back and see where I'm at and what God's done here and all of those things, man, God used every one of those no's to, to teach me more, to shape who I am more, to give me more leadership abilities and, and exposure, uh, and, and relational equity and whatever else to where I firmly believe Whenever I did say yes, I'm way better off, way better prepared, and way better able to be used and lead the situation that I am, and I'm a better person because I said no to some good stuff along the way. Yeah, that's really good, PC. I think the the power of the word no is really the ultimate takeaway here. What I would love to do is maybe when we release this episode, we can release it with these notes. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. you also preached a sermon, which this is obviously not connected yeah. directly, but you preached a sermon a while back oh, uh, no. in a series called Four Words. Yeah. yeah. And this was a couple of the things that you yeah. had mentioned I remember hearing back then. Yeah. Uh, so if you're listening to us and you'd like to hear that message, you can yep. go to unitedcity.church and, and look back at previous messages and uh, all of that. Any closing thoughts for us? Say no, man. Let this let this time be a time whenever you get really good, not feeling like you're down about it, but instead realizing that that no, saying that no is going to lead to much better yeses in the days ahead. What I would also say is um, we want to hear from you on ways that you have said no. I think yeah. that would be a yeah, really cool really thing cool, yeah. for us to be able to read. Uh, you can reach out to us, chriscuba.com. You can also reach out to us by emailing stepup at unitedcity.church. And we would love to hear how you're conquering sin and denying temptation and, and saying no in a holy way. Thanks so much for listening. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Step Up Podcast. Do us a favor and like, subscribe, and share this episode to help us get the word out. We would love to hear from you. So please leave us a comment and even leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. For additional information or to reach out directly, please visit chriscuba.com. That's chriscuba.com. You can follow Pastor Chris on social media and just search Chris Kuba, K-O-U-B-A. You can also follow United City Church on all socials at United City Church. That's U-N-T-D City Church. Thanks so much.